Welcome back, everyone. Um, now that we've completed our unit on social construction, socialization, and standpoint, I want to use this lecture to transition into next week. Um, in week five, we will take a more in-depth examination on one institution in which we learn and are socialized into social constructs, the media. And as such, it is important to understand how institutions can produce a language about difference without actually explicitly pointing out difference. That is, we consume messages about people of color, women, queer communities, homeless people, and many other groups without even realizing it. Furthermore, it is important to remember that social constructs are structural. So in this lecture, we're going to be taking a look at ideology through the concept of color colorblind racism. And colorblind racism is a theory developed by Eduardo Bonilla Silva and helps explain the historical shifts in how racism works. Just for a quick review, in this week we learned about social constructs, socialization, and we revisited standpoint theory. We used semiotics to explore the social construction of race, and we used gender to better understand the cycle of socialization. And through a closer look at sexuality, we revisited standpoint theory to call to question this idea that our social location is an identity. In last week's online lecture, we used the structural oppression framework to understand racism in a structural way. We looked at the social construction of race and racialization and examined how racism is institutional. And we examined how those institutions form a racialized social system through the school to prison pipeline. Structural racism, like all forms of oppression, is a significant barrier to intercultural praxis. And through his examination of colorblind ideology, Eduardo Bonilla Silva provides a framework for how this is the case. Eduardo Bonilla Silva is a professor of sociology at Duke University. He has extensively researched class and classism, political sociology, and race and racism. And one of his seminal works is his book, Racism Without Racists, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America. In his work, Bonilla Silva coins the term colorblind racism as a way to re-examine the ways in which race and racism are studied in academia. And Bonilla Silva, throughout his study of racism, has argued several things. First, um, that racism needs to be understood in a structural way. And this will be the focus of next week's online. Um, and basically what he means is that academics too often study the psychology of racism without examining its economic and other institutional impacts. He also coined the concept of new racism, arguing that too many people think racism ended with the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Instead, Bonilla Silva argues that one, racism did not end with the Civil Rights Act, but rather became more covert, um, and that the avoidance of racial terminology and a growing uh, claim by whites that they experience reverse racism um, he argued that there was an elaboration of a racial agenda over political matters without explicit reference to race. So basically, racialization increases, but no one's actually kind of saying race outright. Um, an invisibility of most mechanisms that uh, produce and reproduce racial inequality and that some of the racial practices used today are actually similar to those used in the Jim Crow era. And so um, what Eduardo Bonilla Silva uh, gave that last point a name, colorblind racism. And colorblind racism can be defined as the denial, minimizing, or rationalizing of racism through the claim of colorblindness. By claiming that they are colorblind, 
Uh, Bonilla Silva found that white um, participants in um, in his study could explain away the existence of racism. And so furthermore, Bonilla Silva called claiming, claiming color blindness itself a racist act. Claiming not to see color or rationalizing racism not only dismisses the experiences of people of color, but also may, helps to maintain a racialized social system. So in other words, it sustains a system of structural oppression. And Bonilla Silva developed this concept using data from two similar projects on racial attitudes, the 1997 survey of social attitudes of college students and the 1998 uh, Detroit area study. And the survey of social attitudes of college students surveyed 627 college students at a Midwestern university, a Southern university, and a West Coast university. 451 of the students interviewed were white. And the Detroit area study interviewed 400 Detroit re residents, uh, 323 were white, 67 were black. And Bonilla Silva took a random 10% sample from the first study and randomly selected 84 respondents from the second study, the majority of whom were white. In his interviews with them, Bonilla Silva was interested in how white participants understood the persistence of racism in the post-civil rights era. And what he found was that even though white participants did not subscribe to the same overt and openly racist um, ideologies of racial difference, they utilize similar frames through a colorblind ideology. In other words, white participants largely believed that racism was no longer an issue, claimed not to see color, while simultaneously utilizing historically racist explanations to explain why racism wasn't an issue. In his analysis of these interviews, Bonilla Silva identified four central frames of colorblindness. That is, he found four forms that colorblind racism takes. Abstract liberalism, naturalization of racism, cultural, uh, cultural racism, and minimization of racism. And I'll go through each of these one by one and explain them in a little more detail. So the first frame that Bonilla Silva identified was abstract liberalism. We discussed liberalism briefly when we discussed neoliberalism. And for a quick review, liberalism emphasizes individual rights, equal opportunity, and that force should not be used to achieve social policy. And we discussed the idea that even though rights are important, liberalism frames rights in a very individualistic way. And that high individualism is what comes into play with the abstract liberal frame of colorblindness. Participants who used this frame explained away the persistence of racism through the use of liberal ideologies. So Bonilla Silva identified three major forms abstract liberalism took. The first way was rationalizing inequality as equal opportunity. So participants who utilized this frame opposed policies like affirmative action, um, which is providing special consideration of race and college admissions, for example, or job opportunities. Um, they also opposed reparations, uh, which is reimbursing African Americans for the Im economic impacts of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. And instead, white participants who utilized this frame argued that everyone should have the same opportunities as everyone else. Any policy or program that would ameliorate the generational impacts of racism was viewed as a handout. And the second form abstract liberalism took was meritocracy, the idea that people get ahead through talent and hard work. White participants in the study explained away racial inequality as a matter of meritocracy. That is, if people of color just worked harder, then they would see the same level of success. And the final form is this idea of being against the use of force. So white participants who use this argument essentially said that any social policy meant to force foster racial equality was a use of force against them. In other words, their individual rights, uh, in particular their individual right to choose, was being violated. So these three forms have two things in common. First, they completely dismiss the realities of structural racism. 
And second, they all use liberal ideologies to claim that any significant measure to create racial equality is a violation of their individual rights. The second frame of colorblind racism that participants used was the naturalization of racism. In this frame, participants dismissed racism as a natural occurrence. Rather than a deliberate act or having anything to do with race, racial inequality was simply a result of all people, regardless of race, wanting to be with their own kind. To them, it went both ways. Both white people and people of color simply wanted to be with their own racial groups. This was a particularly common frame used to explain away racial segregation in housing and education. The map on the left is of the Seattle population in 1960. Black dots on the map represent black residents. And as you can see, they are concentrated in the central district. And this is because this was one of the few areas in Seattle where black residents could legally live. And even though openly racial discrimination in housing is no longer legal, many of the practices used during this time are still in practice today. Furthermore, housing discrimination, discrimination doesn't just affect that one potential home buyer. It impacts the ability to generate wealth for their children and their grandchildren. So racial segregation is not a choice people of color make, but one made for them through generations of structural racism. And all of that history, as well as its present iterations, get erased in this frame. Instead, racism is explained away as just the way it is. There are two more frames to go through, but I think that this is a good stopping point and it'd be useful um, to go through these two frames um, using Bonilla Silva's own data. So I'd like you to, before moving on to the second lecture video, complete exercise 4.1.